All right, guys, we're going to continue with our examination of the West by looking at what farming was like on the plains. And the biggest thing that let this happen was the third of Lincoln's Public Works Acts, and that was the Homestead Act. This allowed farmers to get 160 acres of land for $10. All they had to do was live on the land for five years and improve it, and that meant basically farm it. And what this allowed the government to do was to put a lot of farmers out on the plains, these areas where the railroads were going, and allow the railroads to sell money to other farmers who might not be able to get the homestead claims. And it really sort of set into motion this idea of what life on the plains was going to be like. We had a motley array of neighbors. On one side, a German who could scarce speak English, married to a Bohemian who could speak little English and no German. On another side, a family of Swedes fresh from the old country. On an adjoining farm, a Scotsman with a Missouri wife. Nearby, a family from Iowa, another family from Illinois, some old, some young, some illiterate, some well-educated, yet all engaged in the same enterprise. As more and more railroads expanded into the West, an intense competition between them began. Settlers were sought who would provide business for their freight trains and buy the land the railroads had been given as government subsidies. You can lay track to the Garden of Eden, said the head of the Northern Pacific, but what good is it if the only inhabitants are Adam and Eve? Western states also contended with one another for new residents. The Homestead Act promised 160 acres of public land to any person who filed a claim, paid a $10 fee, and agreed to work the property for five years. In the 1870s, Kansas grew by more than half a million people. Nebraska's population quadrupled. 200 Scottish families settled on the Kansas-Nebraska border. The Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society lured Jews from Eastern Europe to Oregon, Colorado, Kansas, the Dakotas. German Russian Mennonites, Swedish, Dutch, French, Bohemian, Irish, and Norwegian families were soon scattered across the plains. In the villages of Europe, you might be only a few steps away from your neighbor. Certainly within hearing distance, you could hear the village's church bells ringing on a Sunday morning. Suddenly here they were isolated many miles from neighbors and from villages with long periods of time between any kind of interaction. They had wind sickness, they called it, from the constant blowing of the wind. They planted trees around their houses, not simply for the shade or for the beauty, but to protect them from the immensity of the, the landscape. They started towns like Lindsborg and Hafnungstall. New Alexanderval and Dannebrog, some with the same street plans as their old villages in Europe. And they planted wheat they had brought along from as far away as Russia. It flourished as no other domestic crop ever had before on the semi-arid plains, and would one day help make the United States the agricultural wonder of the world. The men had farmed in many cases most of their lives. They'd had to struggle against roots and rocks and all of these things that made farming difficult. They looked around them here and there were thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of acres without a root or a rock. They could put their plow in the ground and go miles and miles straight ahead without worrying about a hill. This was grass, ground, earth that had never been turned in all of history except maybe by a buffalo's horn. They said the first time a plow went through that ground it sounded like the opening of a giant zipper from the grassroots tearing as the plow went through it. To them this was a dream come true. The farmers would build homes out of these densely packed uh, soil sod bricks uh, there was not a lot of rainfall, which made farming kind of difficult on the, on the plains. 
which was kind of uh, the selling point that the railroads hid, a, hid away in their promotions. They tried to sell it like there was a lot of rainfall. There really isn't on the Great Plains. But here you see an example of a sod house, a seed drill, which allowed them to plant their seeds deeper in the ground, closer to the groundwater, which allowed for the crops to grow, and then to use post rocks, the limestone that's very common here in Kansas with barbed wire, to fence their land because there really weren't any trees. There was not enough rainfall for all of this. The windmills that they put out there would pump the water from underground because obviously we do have a lot of wind here. Uh, a lot of people went into debt, though, because they were not able to have enough land to actually make any money. In 1889, Congress opened Oklahoma to settlement, uh, this area that was called the Indian Territory for the longest time. And there were basically two classes of people who showed up. You had the boomers who arrived on time to run for their land. You see here in this image. At a prescribed time, gunshot went off, and you rushed out there to get your land. But you also had the Sooners, and these were people who snuck across the border, got to their land early, and they were breaking the law, basically land thieves. And in 1890, Congress actually declared the frontier closed. There's another group of people who settled on the plains at this time. These are African Americans leaving the South during the Jim Crow era and coming to Kansas. And they're known as the Exodusters, uh, this exodus, this mass movement leaving. They're afraid of violence in the South due to the Ku, the Ku Klux Klan, the segregation of Jim Crow laws. Uh, there was a lot of lack of opportunity for African Americans in the South. And you also have the promotions of this man here, Benjamin Papp Singleton, which helped encourage many of them to migrate to Kansas, selling it on the fact that Kansas chose to be a free state. And about 26,000 African Americans made it to Kansas in the 1870s. Thanks, guys, for paying attention. Hopefully we took good notes.